We've now finished the first round of our lectures, the first round of the chapters where I introduced you to some of the tools that you can use in R. As we move into the next part of the class, we'll really be digging a lot deeper into how you can use some of those tools more deeply, other tools that are out there, and some of the principles that are underlying the things that you're doing. So you can really start playing around with this stuff a lot more yourself. Today, we're going to talk more about one of those principles and then see some rules to put that into action. The principle in this case is something called tidy data. So we've been a little bit lucky before where we've used data sets that were really nicely uh, kind of formatted to work well with all of the tidyverse functions and tidyverse packages. But it turns out that sometimes you will get your data in the wild and it won't be in a format that's quite as easy to play around with that. So there's a wonderful paper that came out a few years ago. It's by Hadley Wickham, who also created some, uh, um, most of the packages that are in the tidyverse. And this whole package talks about the idea of how if you follow certain rules with your data, it's going to be very easy to work with it, including using the tools in things like dplyr and ggplot2. So I've put a link in here to that paper, and the material in the slides in this first lecture is coming directly from that paper, including the examples. You will be responsible to read this paper for the quiz on this section. This is one of the few required readings that we have over, over this course. So the characteristics of tidy data are the following. First of all, each variable, so each thing that you can measure on an observation, will form its own column. Second, each observation, each kind of unit that you measure, whether it's a study subject or whether it's, it's a day if you're measuring weather data, each of those forms its own row. And finally, each type of observational unit forms a separate table. So again, by getting your data into this format before you move into using ggplot and using statistical modeling and other tools to really analyze and explore your data, it becomes much easier to do all of that. You really have a lot of flexibility to create almost anything that you want, but you do need to start with your data in this kind of standardized format. So I put these characteristics in, but I think that it is a little bit easier to help understand what makes a data set tidy in this sense if you take a look at some of the problems that can come up. So Hadley Wickham's paper that you'll be reading for this week, it identifies five different ways that data that you often see data being untidy. The first of them is that column headers are values, not variable names. The second, that there are multiple variables stored in one column. The third, that variables are stored in both rows and columns. The fourth, that multiple types of observational data, observational units are stored in the same table. And finally, the case where you have data on the same observational unit, but stored in different tables. So instead of trying to explain them right now, in these next few slides, we'll go through examples of each of those and how those could be resolved to take the original data set in each case and convert it into one that's following these tidy data rules so it'll be easy to work with. So the first case is that column headers are values, not variable names. Again, this is a way that you often see data breaking the rules for that tidy format. So this is an example. In this case, it's giving some different religions, giving different annual incomes, and then the numbers in the cells are some count. This might be for a census or something like that where it's giving um, number of people or number of households that fall in each of those categories. So in this case, one of the things that we likely would care about are those income levels. We might want to do something like facet plots by income levels. Um, however, these are stored up in the column names. When we're doing everything with ggplot and with the different kind of tidyverse uh, uh, functions, we're working with stuff that's in a column. That's an easy way for us to work with stuff. If we have things in the column names, that becomes much harder to work with. So to make this data tidy, we want to take this information out of the column names and have it in its own column where we can really work with it. We often say in this case that we are taking the data from a wider format, you can see that this isn't so long, but it's pretty wide, to a longer one where we're going to bring some of that information in the column names down and that will make the data frame um, longer, but it'll be a little bit, a little bit less wide. So here's the solution. In this case, that information on the income levels has been pulled in. So before, 
we had one row for each of these religious categories. Now we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six rows for each of those because we'll have one for each combination of income level and then the count in the cell. So right here you can see that. You can see that we now have a number more for, for the first religion. And now we have one row for each of these separate um, combinations of religion and income level. The next problem is that multiple variables are stored in a single column. So this is an example where we again have data by country and then by year, and we have some kind of cases. This might be for some epidemiological study, for example. Here in this middle column that's named column right now, you have some information that if you look at the data, the data directory for this, this actually is giving both the, the, um, the sex, male or female, and then also an age category. So this first one is for males 0 to 14, the next for males 15 to 24, and so on. And then we can see down here we get uh, to females 0 to 14. Now the problem with this is that we might want to separately look at male, female versus age category. Where they're in the same column, this is going to be really hard for us to do. And so to make this tidy, we want to split this up. We want to have a separate column for male, female, and then another column for age. Here's the solution. Again, this is a pretty straightforward one, but we're just taking that column that before was put together and now we've split it. So we have two separate columns that we can work with. Now we could do things like if we're doing a ggplot, we could do color uh, by the age category without having it split as well by male, female. The third common problem is that variables are stored in both rows and columns. This is one, um, in this case, they're, they're giving an example that's showing it for weather data, and this certainly has some characteristics that show up pretty often for that type of data. So in this case, We've got kind of two issues going on. First of all, we've got the issue that we showed at first where we've got a variable that we might care about up in the column names. In this case, we're giving um, a certain station ID and then a, a year and a month, but then the day in the year is shown by the column up here. And this is cropped off, but could continue out to 30 or 31 days, depending on the month. In the cell, we have some information on weather measurements. So for example, this 27.3 is giving the maximum temperature at a particular station in February of 2010, February 2nd, because we've got day two here. So we certainly are going to want to do just like we did in the first case and bring the information from the, these, um, these column names down into a column. But the second issue that's going on here is that we've actually got some information about different variables that's stored across different rows. So it's very likely that we might want to take the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature and compare them to each other or create a scatter plot or do something like that. These are two variables that are measured at the same unit, at the unit of day. And they're things that we might want to compare, but right now it's going to be really hard to do that because they're kind of tucked in to these alternating rows. So what we can do to fix that, it'll take two steps. The first step is to take care of that first problem of having some of the information in the column names. So the first thing, again, we've taken it from wide to narrower, where now we've got a separate row for each date. So we're bringing in that information in the column names in terms of what day of the year it was. The second thing we need to do now is we want to have these as separate columns, the Tmax and the Tmin. So we can spread this out just a little bit so that these values get spread across two separate columns. And so we have those separate columns for each of those separate variables. Here you can see that. And so now we've got a separate column for Tmax and Tmin. So now the structure is that we have one row for each combination of weather station and date of observation. And then we have observations for that unit in terms of the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature. The fourth problem is when multiple types of observational units are stored in the same table. So we've been talking a little bit, I've used those words of kind of observational units, but maybe I haven't defined them yet. It's really the unit at which you're measuring, at which you have different values for, for, um, for your different variables that you're capturing. So here there are two of those observational units, and by having two together, we really end up with a lot of repeated information. 
so this data, this is um, giving a data set for um, the the status, I think, on like the Billboard top 100 or whatever for, for different songs. And so it gives it for a year. It gives a lot of information about the song, like the artist, the time, the track. But then it's also giving a date and a week and the rank that date and week. So we've got two things going on here. First of all, we have an observational unit that's the song. So the kinds of variables being measured for that are the artist, the year, the time, and the track. You can see that these all get repeated every time that specific song is included in this table. The other unit of observation that we have is for a song and a week. And so here we have the date of that week, the week number that it's been on, on, this, um, on this chart, and then the rank on the chart. So these two units of observation, by, by trying to put them together in the same table, you end up with all this repeated data. Instead, it, is, it would be tidier if we had two separate tables for these separate units of observation. One where we include the information where the unit of observation is the song, so the artist, the track, and the time, and then the other one where we include just the date and the rank for that date. So here that's showing that second unit of observation. In this case, an ID has been added that could link between those two. In some cases, you would have um, something, something that, that's identifiable within the, the data itself, so the, the, um, the name of the song, for example. However, for, for musical songs, that's not the case where you can be guaranteed that you don't have two of the same. So an ID is helpful here to make sure that you have this distinguishable information for each song. The fifth problem is kind of the inverse of that. In some cases, you will have data on the same unit of observation, but you have it stored in separate tables. Uh, that can be a little bit tricky because you really need to put it together to be able to do things like, like plotting scatter plots of, of one of the columns versus the other. In that case, the columns really need to be in the same data frame. So an example that, that comes up a lot in the work that I do is um, a lot of times we will be looking at the relationship between daily environmental conditions and daily health outcomes. And we often get those data from different sources. So we might have data from the EPA or from NOAA on outdoor weather conditions and outdoor air pollution. And then we might have data that we're getting in from the CDC or some other organization on the health outcomes. So to make that tidy, since it's at the same unit of observation in terms of often like a, a county by date, um, to make it tidy, we really need to merge those two together before we start doing plots and statistical modeling and all of that. 